History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno. This is Lecture 11, The Nation and the Spirit of the People in Hegel, December 15th, 1964. Adorno's notes for this lecture. Transition to the spirit of the people as Hegel's attempt to individualize the overall trajectory of history. Insertion, Isla. This actual and organic spirit of a people actualizes and reveals itself through the relationship between the particular national spirits and in world history as the universal world spirit. And be the word universal that precisely marks the regression to existential logic with its additive approach. The principles of the spirits of peoples are in general of a limited nature and their deeds and destinies are the manifest dialectic of these spirits from which the universal spirit produces itself and exercises its right, which is the highest right of all over infinite spirits in world history as the world's court of judgment. Addendum. Like Spengler, Hegel speaks somewhere of the natural death of the spirits of peoples as of individuals. He hypostasizes pseudo-concreteness, boils it down into individuality. This gives it an archaic flavor, the individual consciousness reduced to something accidental. End of addendum. And be the fact that the spirits of peoples are necessarily destined to decline and fall. But if each spirit of the people is limited and hence doomed, it is the form of each national spirit that is to be preserved and absorbed into a higher one. Reflection on this is absent in Hegel. Incidentally, the particularity of the spirits of peoples is problematic. It is above all the folkways, mores, that are what is substantial in Hegel's view. They resemble one another to the point of abstractness, like the unconscious. And B. Music. Psychoanalysis against the illusion that the archaic is more concrete. There are older, even harder forms of repression. Addendum. Hegel in search of the anti Cartesian in opposition to abstract national equality, he wishes to salvage the ideas of Vico and Monte- Montesquieu, as well as Herder, has its good side. This is This good side is not constant. End of addendum. With his concept of spirit of the people, Hegel is unreflectingly implicated in the idolization of the nation that emerged at the turn of the 19th century. Nation itself, a historical concept that arose in the 18th century. Les hommes de l'être ou riche. The thing itself is likewise historical. Bourgeois form of organization regressing to tribalism nature suppressed and re-emerging in mutilated form. Manifests itself in Hegel as an unchanging component of history, immutable in the changing procession of individual spirits of the people. Hegel full of such constants as prima philosophia. The simple consideration that we would soon run out of the spirit of the peoples that had not yet made their appearance does not occur at all. The nation supposed to tame the diffused tribes, gentes, but there is something retrograde about it in a developed bourgeois society, and be such admixtures are necessary in bourgeois society as a corrective to the mastery of nature in the service of the principle of lordship. This is fetishized because otherwise the people who are threatened by it would not fit in with it. Insertion 12a. Nowadays, nations facing the real identity of historical processes are largely ideological, conserved. The experience in the Weltliner Keller dialectic to Americans' concrete manifestations are merely masks, farce, but on the exchange principle, that is what they really are. Um, And then, end of lecture. Notes taken by Hilmar Tillich. According to Hegel's philosophy of right, the spirit of the peoples objectivizes itself in the nations and beyond them in the state. At the same time, both the spirit of the people and the nation should be examined in the context of a theory of universal history or world spirit. More particularly, the relationship between spirit of the people and world spirit 
is such that the world spirit neither hovers above world history, nor does it become realized immediately in world history. Instead, it assumes the shape of the various spirits of the peoples, and of their relations to one another, relations of waxing and waning. According to um, Hegel's philosophy of right, the actual and organic spirit of a people actualizes and reveals itself through the relationship between the particular national spirits and in world history as the universal world spirit. A subtle non-dialectical contradiction in this point in this points to the problems inherent in Hegel's philosophy of history. The world spirit actualizes itself through the, re the relationship between the particular national spirits that is strictly dialectical. We find the same thing in the phenomenology where the procession of figures or shapes is not separated from the particular figures. On the other hand, in terms of existential logic, because the world spirit actualizes itself through the relationship between the particular national spirits and in world history as the universal, universal world spirit, Hegel is appealing to a higher degree of universality. This is significant because, alongside the conception of the absolute as something concrete, there is a recurrent notion that the universal possesses a greater dignity than the particular. Hegel always wants to have it both ways at once, a radical dialectic from which nothing is left out, while at the same time he remains a Platonist, who presents a theory of universal substance in which the national spirits are introduced as specific instances of this all-inclusive universal. There is, no doubt, there is no doubt that Hegel's sympathies lie with the universal, but he sticks with the idea of national spirits, shying away from the conception of a universal spirit of mankind, and indeed even the concept of mankind as such. In the philosophy of right, Hegel writes, The principles of the spirits of nations are in general of a limited nature because of that particularity in which they have their objective actuality and self-consciousness as existent individuals, and their deeds and destinies and their mutual relations are the manifest dialectic of the finitude of these spirits. It is through this dialectic that the universal spirit, the spirit of the world, produces itself in its freedom from all limits, and it is this spirit which exercises its right, which is the highest right of all, over finite spirits in world history as the world's court of judgment. The courts with their judges, that reminds us of the transcendental world spirit who presides over the individual spirits of the nations. This is undoubtedly a factor here. But what is even more important is the echo of Goeth's, Ma Goeth's manifesto, or Mephisto, sorry, for all things that exist deserve to perish and would not be missed. Because of their limited nature, the national spirits are fallible and finite. They wither and die, deserving their ruin because of their limited nature. The world's spirit, more properly, the absolute, consists solely in their ruin. Later on, Spengler was criticized for his refusal to acknowledge progress, but there is a certain continuity between Hegel's metaphysics of history and the later nihilist of history. Admittedly, Hegel, goes, or Hegel does speak of progress and the consciousness of freedom. But this progress consists only in the succession, senseless in itself, of the individual national spirits, a succession brought about by their finitude or finitude culpability. Hegel speaks of the natural death of the national of the national spirits as one might speak of the death of individuals. The category of national spirits as collective individuals fits in very conveniently with Hegel's desire to give concrete shape to the relations between universal and particular but it is essentially a pseudo-concreteness. The universal character of a people, a nation, is regarded as an individual and hypostasized. It is even treated as something possessing an essence of its own. Despite the limited nature of the national spirits with their mores, their repressive customs, and usages, they are endowed with an absolute right vis-a-vis -vis actual individuals. The principle governing the decline and fall of the national spirits should have been the sublation of their form, and their objectification, namely the actual nation, their elevation to a higher stage of being. In reality, this has come to pass since nations have ceased to be the substantial units of history. The conversion of national spirits into particularities 
the replacement of actual individuals by individual national spirits is problematic. What is problematic is not just the repressive nature of the national spirit and its attitude towards individuals, but the individuality of the national spirit itself. Hegel reduces this individuality to specific national, natural constants. Interestingly, these include the concept of race, which, following his criticism in the chapter on physiognomy and phrenology, and the phenomenology of spirit, should have been excluded. If we assume the existence of pre-individual societies, the primacy of the collective, we find that the structures of such national collectives are surprisingly similar to each other. That they are not so very individuated at all, just as folk melodies that antedate individuated musical composition do not differ all that markedly, but seem all to have been stamped in the same mold. Psychoanalysis ascribes the basic mental processes to a minimum number of psychological patterns. The pervasive structures of totemism, the prohibition on incest, taboos, etc. In themselves, primitive and national characteristics as mere natural phenomena are no more differentiated than the unconscious, which Freud locates as prior to the process of individuation. What Hegel describes as the particular feature of the national spirits is precisely not the element of nationality. The situation is not that the national spirits form a concrete manifold, which is subsequently subjected to a rationalizing process. Primitive forms of mind are characterized by a certain abstractness, which comes as something of a surprise. So in reality, the idea that history exhibits a progressive increase in abstraction is too simple. Individuation is an intermediate state between the archaic and the abstraction that arises from the process, of ex the process of exchange that subjugates the individual. Hegel's philosophy of history is implicated in the cult of the nation, but this too has its progressive side, since the tendency is for the overall course of history to become individuated, in contrast to the philosophical tendency to construct an overall pattern from a small number of concepts. In this respect, Hegel belongs to the anti-Cartesian trend, as exemplified by Vico's Scienza Nova and Montesquieu's, or Montesquieu, from whom Hegel took over the theory that institutions are the product of history, a theory that cannot be gleaned from abstract rationality, as well as by Hammond and Herder's speculations. The progressive element in this is the more dynamic view of the national spirit in contrast with the previous static theory. The concrete articulation of history is opposed to measuring it in general terms against the progress of enlightenment. That is Hegel's intention. In the early 18th century, these categories were progressive, but their significance changed with the passage of time. The concept of a particular that has developed historically of a concrete historical power such as the nation, can age and become obsolete. If it is retained despite further developments, it turns reactionary and violent, just as happened to Hegel's national spirit as opposed to Herder's. The concept of the nation is a late arrival. It was alien to the Middle Ages. The turning point came in the 18th century when it was defined as a sort of class concept. The nation became synonymous with the notables, with the rich and the educated. The concept of race only emerged when that of the nation no longer sufficed, and it was necessary to become all-inclusive. Both the concept of the nation and the nation itself are products of history. They are not a natural category, but the attempt to create a bourgeois form of organization by regressing to tribalism. These tribal associations, natural associations, have gradually been forced to retreat more and more in the history of the West. The modern world wished to assist these associations, which had been kept in check by feudalism and the Christian feudal world. It made a pact with these natural formations that had been suppressed and that were coming once again to the fore. This is the source of the savagery and aggression of national units. A mutilated nature is brought together with the nation by means of oppression. This mutilated thing continues to reveal itself in nationalism to this very day. Bourgeois rationality is combined with a return to the pre-bourgeois natural, so natural association. This is what constrained Hegel to confer on the nation 
the quality of immutability and to make it a fixed constituent of history. Hegel's theory puts on the brakes at this point and brings the dialectic to a standstill, a theory that involves constants in dialectics simultaneously, that is something he tr contrived to harmonize ingeniously in the logic, but it cannot be sustained in the long run. The nation was supposed to constrain the gentes and at, that, at the same time to honor them. However, that is repressive implications. The irrational elements in developed rational bourgeois society are not coincidental, but essential. Ends means rationality predominates, but the ends, the organization as a whole, remain irrational. This explains the persistence of irrational institutions such as the nation and the family, because the theory as a whole is not transparent, not compatible with the principle of rationality. The citizen always has a bad conscience when he operates with such concepts. Hence the rancor and rage in the concept of the nation, something that is perpetuated in the Eastern Bloc countries, where cosmopolitanism is a term of abuse. Sacrifice for one's own nation does not produce the increase in the standard of living that people expect. This is why the nation has to be a value for its own sake, independently of its relation to people. This mechanism prevails objectively. It corresponds to a need, but one that is concealed from people. The nationalism of the rulers is just as pig-headed and unthinking as that of the ruled. In comparison with the construction of a radically organized society based on exchange, the nation and the national spirit are, are anachronisms. The individual is supposed to derive his own substance exclusively from the spirit of the nation to which he belongs. Although in Goeth, Hegel had a contrary example before his very eyes.